So I thought it was finally time to get around to a review of the year. And I'll start off with the things that went badly. So the, the worst thing really that happened, or at least the kind of most surprising and shocking thing that went, that happened was that every single one of the tomato plants in the polytunnel got blight. I noticed it pretty early on. It was only on the leaves. I took all those affected leaves off. I left all the unaffected leaves on and it just gradually spread to the stems and to more leaves. But I left most of the tomatoes actually on the plants and gradually as the kind of days progressed, I just moved ripening tomatoes off the plants and moved them into the hall actually just on the windowsill in there. And we put them in great big cardboard boxes and we interplant, interplanted and we intermixed them with apples, really ripe apples that were starting to rot, windfall apples off the allotment. And it's a lot cheaper and easier to get hold of windfall apples uh, on an allotment than it is bananas. And so that worked really well for us. And I think that they, a, a, a really ripe apple that's got like little spots of brown on it, I, I, it's just about to rot seems to give off more ethylene gas than a banana in my experience. And we also tried that same trick actually with the peppers to get them riper. We didn't do it off the, off the vine. We did it by putting loads of rotten apples underneath the peppers. And again, that seemed to accelerate the ripening. So I'm pretty bullish on that technique and we'll definitely be using it again this year. So, the bottom line though with the blight two conclusions really that i drew one is don't panic you know nothing horrendous happened you know the blight didn't like decimate everything we didn't lose any tomatoes we pretty much ripened every single tomato and maybe the eating quality wasn't quite so good but most of them went to cooking so it didn't really matter so you know we didn't panic and I'll put actually links to some of those videos uh, down below so you can see the, the progress through the days of how the blight spread. So the second thing was that just in case this happens again, I think I'm going to plant half of my polytunnel tomatoes to Crimson Crush and Cocktail Crush. Uh, so Cocktail Crush is the uh, blight resistant cherry tomato from the same family effectively as, as Crimson Crush. Um, and just as a hedge basically against that happening again. Now we've grown tomatoes in the polytunnel for four years now, I think, and this is the first year we've had blight. So I'm not kind of panicking about it. I'm not expecting it to happen again, but I am just gonna be on the lookout for it. And I am just hedging my bets. We're also gonna grow more tomatoes in the back garden. We didn't have any blight in the back garden outside even though we had it inside in the polytunnel. So again, I just think a diversity of locations and a diversity of different varieties makes sense. And that I think makes sense in gardening full stop. So the second thing that went wrong, and it's another example of this diversity point, is, <laughs> I forgot what it was. Oh, right. yeah, whitefly on the brassicas. Now, we, we always get a little bit of white fly. We don't worry about it. And generally speaking, it doesn't worry us. You know, there's no real loss in harvests. There's no loss of quality or anything like that. There's just a few little flies buzzing around, a little bit more clean up on the leaves when we wash them. But this year it was just really bad. And it was particularly bad in the back garden. It wasn't quite so bad in the front garden. It wasn't quite so bad on my allotment plot and was hardly present at all on Debbie's allotment plot. So, and they're all, all of these four locations are all within about, you know, a mile of each other. And so very similar conditions, but for whatever reason, the back garden was just really bad. And we just put up with it. We didn't take hardly any plants out. We just sprayed them with uh, washing up liquid sort of stuff, um, horticultural soap. Every now and again, it didn't really solve the problem at all. It just felt like it was doing something. Just took up all, off all the offending leaves and just kept the plants alive, basically. And they're actually looking pretty good now. And so we will still get a pretty good spring harvest off them. So, you know, it's no disaster. The other thing that I noticed was, again, diversity of varieties here. So... We grow lots of different brassicas 
and their collets were hardly affected at all. The Brussels sprouts weren't affected very much at all on the allotment. It was mainly the kales. So anyway, there we go. That was another really pretty bad thing that happened last year. The third thing that happened was we tried to grow all of our summer carrots in containers and we grew them really high up to so about one and a half meters off the ground um, in you know on top of IBC tanks and had a lot of them in in these containers and I was like hopeful that there would be carrot fly free because you know everybody tells you that carrot fly don't fly that high etc etc and well carrot fly do fly that high <laughs> and we got some really bad carrot fly in those containers and it was really disappointing because as I said these were my summer carrots and I really like carrots I like to have them every day and so yeah what did we learn about that well first off carrot fly do fly high and or get blown that high in the wind or something but basically they can get that high and the other thing we learned was maybe we planted them um, slightly too densely in the containers. So I've reduced my planting density guidance in my ebook now uh, down to, I think, about 30 carrots in a 35 litre container or something like that. I also learned that 50 litre containers, which are the ones I use a lot in the polytunnel because it gets hot and so they need a big, nice big container for, as a water reservoir. They're really heavy when you have to list, lift them onto the top of an IBC tank. So now I'm sticking with 35 litre and 30 litre containers from now on. Um, but, you know, basically I'm really now unsure now about growing summer carrots in containers. Uh, the quality wasn't as good as they were in the ground. I'm not going to give up on it totally next year, this year. Um, I still will grow a few. I'll see how they do. I will try and put some fleece or mesh or something over them this time. Um, anyway, we'll give it a go again just to see because it seems a shame to waste all that space on top of the IVC tanks, but I won't be depending on them. So last year, fortunately, I did grow a square metre of uh, carrots in the back garden in... I think it was probably May, something like that, that I sowed them, uh, maybe the, towards the end of May. And they were fantastically like free of, um, of carrot fly. And so as a result of that, towards the end of summer, we did get a really good, nice crop of carrots. And of course, all of my autumn, winter and spring carrots, I grew in the ground like I always do. It was just the summer carrots that I was experimenting with. And they've been absolutely fabulous. So I've just turned over more ground to carrots basically this year than, than, uh, than I did last year. And so I will be growing my summer carrots now in the ground, but I will just try a few in containers just to see uh, if I can pull it off because as I say, it's just nice and, and we, we never have enough carrots. So um, yeah, so we also have lettuce root aphid uh, and last we got a bit of that last year as well, the year before last, uh, in the back garden. And then this year again, we got it in the back garden. And it only seems to be a problem in August. And it's, it's a problem with most varieties, although some of them kind of weather it a little bit. The, the rate of growth just drops so low. Uh, so you can tell, you know, there's something wrong because, you know, things that used to grow, you know, double, double in size, like every two weeks or something suddenly grows like 10% in that same two week period. So I fortunately planted a bed on the allotment and I've never had uh, lettuce root aphid on the allotment. So I, I was okay, I could survive it. So what I'm going to do this year is I am going to plant um, a bit more lettuce uh, back on the allotment for an August and sort of September harvest, just in case I get lettuce root aphid again. Um, and I will still sow a few in the back garden because it's just more convenient. But um, yeah, so it's just these pests kind of accumulate. And in a small space like the back garden, really, there's not a lot you can do. You know, if, if it's in one area, then it's probably going to be the, the whole of the back garden is going to then be susceptible to it the following year. And the final thing that went wrong was one little patch of beetroot that had been planted two weeks after my main beetroot bed but in the same bed 
uh, following broad beams. This didn't grow. All the others grew fantastic. So all the others were like this, and then these were like this. Tiny little things, didn't grow. And, you know, and they were only two weeks different. And they're basically the same batch of actual seedlings just left in the module trays for an extra two weeks. And then was it being planted after broad beans? I can't really believe it because I'm sure I've planted uh, beetroot after broad beans before, but I'm 100% sure. Um, anyway, for whatever reason, they just didn't grow. Now, beetroot is an incredibly important crop to us. Again, it's one of those things you eat pretty much every day. And so I won't be sowing them after broad beans again, but uh, and I won't be sowing them in that bed. And the other thing that I found, which I didn't really realise, was that the end of this bed is kind of underneath a tree and it just gets no rain at all. So this tree just completely shelters it from the rain. And I didn't realise that, and so I didn't water that bit of the bed well enough, and so those didn't grow very well either. So I was two little patches of beetroots on this big long bed, but just didn't perform at all. Um, now I think I can mitigate the growing bit, um, the watering bit, obviously just by hand watering that bit a bit more effectively. But um, yeah, it was quite shocking when I realised, I finally sort of think, these aren't growing, what's going wrong? And um, then I sort of dug around in the soil and I realised that it was it was dry, completely dry. So what went right? Well, yeah, it's been a pretty good year, actually. It was the first year that we didn't have Jenny's plot. And so that reduced our harvest volumes quite a lot. So the year before last, we harvested about £12,000 worth of veg. And we fed 28 people and there was too much work. I didn't. Well, I enjoyed it a little bit because it was a lockdown year. I had nothing else to do, nothing better to do. But I definitely didn't want to repeat it. It was a kind of experience, felt a bit like being a market gardener, even though we were growing hundreds of different things. Um, I definitely didn't want to do that again. Um, so when we dropped Jenny's plot, we, you know, we just decided we would grow a bit more intensively, but in a lot less space. Um, and we would also grow a different mix of food. So rather than mainly focusing on the high value crops, which we typically have done, um, we decided that we would just grow a lot more staples. So we've always grown the staples for Debbie and I, um, but we haven't grown, you know, enough potatoes and carrots and onions and parsnips and, you know, et cetera, for, for the rest of the family. Um, so we decided, as I say, to, to grow on a lot less land, to grow more intensively, but to grow a lot of low value crops. Uh, and as a result of that, we only harvested 8,000 pounds worth of edge, but that was still pretty good. Um, and if you're interested in, you know, how we work out how much we've done, harvested and that, I'll put a link uh, to the chapter of my ebook where I talk about that. Um, so I was really happy with that. Um, in terms of actual savings off our food bill, that was only maybe £3,000 or something like that because we gift a lot of veg, surplus veg to other people, friends and family. But, um, you know, £3,000 just like, you know, more than covers like, you know, like a huge margin, all of our costs. So, you know, we still have a, a significant net saving. Uh, so gardening is a, has to be, for me, a zero cost hobby. So I was really pleased with the financial side of things, with the overall amount that we harvested. And um, I put actually just a little kind of harvest photo. So every week we take a photo of most of the harvest. We can't uh, fit it all in in a single photo most of the time, but... Um, you know, it gives you a, a reasonable idea of the sort of, you know, amount that we harvest each week of the year. Um, and I don't include the bulk harvests in that, in, in these little photos, because the bulk harvests uh, are not part of our just weekly, regular harvest volume. Um, anyway, I was really happy. So what were the real highlights of uh, the gardening year? Well, I would say the peppers had to be. So this was the first year that I implemented 100% my new growing system for peppers. And it just worked absolutely fantastic. I was so pleased with it. They grew so much better than the way that they grew in the polytunnel. They grew so much better than outside. They were just great. And so I was growing them under low tunnels with a lot of ventilation at the bottom, but then a lot of warmth at the top. Um, so, yeah, I was, you know, just thrilled with the volume of peppers that we harvested. And we're doing 
you know, just as many peppers next year. And so I'm really, really excited about the prospects for peppers. We're doing a lot more lunchbox peppers actually last year because we found that we had so many peppers for processing and we wanted more for eating fresh and especially for kids. So yeah, we're gonna try a lot of that. Uh, the indoor cucumbers in this conservatory did amazing, really fantastic. And they kept us going from about May all the way through actually until sort of August, September time. But we did grow some in the polytunnel and uh, we just didn't grow enough. And so I think that, you know, we get through about six or seven cucumbers a day and we could probably get through 10 cucumbers a day. So yeah, I'm just gonna grow some more in the polytunnel and, you know, cause they just love it in the polytunnel so much. So anyway, that's definitely, that was definitely a highlight. And, you know, I think the outdoor tomatoes did amazingly well. So I was really, really pleased with those. And I kind of got to double down on outdoor tomatoes because I think the taste of outdoor tomatoes is a little bit better than tomatoes grown under glass or polythene. They're just the amount of light that they get and this full spectrum of light that they get from being outside just gives them that extra touch of uh, flavor. So. Yeah, we're going to still going to grow plenty in the polytunnel, but we are going to grow uh, a few more outdoor ones and some more outdoor peppers as well. So the potatoes did really well this year and we've had enough potatoes to harvest a big tub, like a 35 uh, litre tub every week of the year, pretty much. Um, and we have had them all year round uh, and we have had baking potatoes and sort of main crop sized potatoes pretty much all year round as well. So all of our experiments in growing early potatoes of all types worked really well this year. And so I'm pleased to have got all that documented in the ebook. Um, uh, but we are gonna grow probably about half the potatoes that we grew this year because they grew so well and we're eating less potatoes. And uh, so we just think, you know, there's just no point in growing quite so many. So we'll reduce the potato volume down maybe by a third or maybe even a half. And that will give us that space, as I said, to grow some more tomatoes and peppers outside. So as I mentioned, we'd grown more staples this year. So we grew a lot of onions and I was particularly pleased with some of the interplanting experiments that we did. So one of the favorite interplants turns out to be parsnips. So fairly widely spaced, about eight, eight inches or something like that. So you get a really good sized parsnip. Um, but that leaves a lot of space in between those parsnips. And so we put uh, onion sets in there and we got a fantastic crop of, uh, of onions and a fantastic crop of parsnips. And neither of them seem to uh, know that the other one was there. And of course you're taking the onions out in August at the time when the parsnips are really sort of growing and taking up a lot of space. And even before then, really, the onions, of course, are just growing high and the parsnips are still fairly low. So really, there was no effect. So I think that's a fantastic interplant. We just did loads and loads of great interplanting experiments this year. We did onions in beetroot. Uh, we did salad onions in lettuce. Um, we did radish interplanted with spinach early in the year. All sorts of them, really. And I've documented them all again in the ebook. And so... I was really happy with that. And I also found that I just got a lot better at my successional sowings. And I've done a lot of work over winter in building a successional sowing uh, database that kind of uses the, the framework for potatoes, like the first, early, second, early, early main crop, main crop, late crop sort of approach, and applied that to pretty much all the veg, fruit and veg that we grow to give that same sort of model, you know, so what are the, what are the first earlies of all of the different uh, types of things that we grow and the, what are the best varieties for first earlies, what are the best varieties for second earlies, best varieties for early main crop, best varieties for main crop, what are the best sowing times, what are the best sowing techniques, what are the best ways of covering them, what are the planting densities, you know, all the different variables for all of these different successions. And of course, all the timings for them, when to sow them, when to plant them, when to harvest them, when to finish harvesting them. And all of those fit with what to follow them with and what to proceed them with. So those um, the sort of big, you know, big picture planting plan side of things. So I've built a lot of that stuff this year. So I was really happy with my winter. So it really kept me busy this winter and I've really enjoyed it. 
I think the other thing that I've really enjoyed this year is really doubling down on how to have a kind of continuity of different of the same type of veg but maybe different varieties of veg or even things from different families that substitute for each other and I've worked quite hard on that and I'll give you a couple of examples so with spinach for example we grow giant winter over winter and into early spring and then we use red kitten which is another true spinach in spring and then we switch to Mikado which is an Asian spinach and we do that from sort of late spring until early summer then we do New Zealand spinach uh, in early in midsummer and into autumn and then we go back to uh, a true spinach again and so that gives us a really nice continuity of supply and then we supplement that with field bean tops and with chard and so that gives us a really nice set of what we think of as kind of stir fry greens but you can use them in all sorts of different ways of course and another great example probably would be leeks so we really love leeks but you know really we can realistically only get leeks from about august time to about march time so what do we do for the rest of the year so in march we're using elephant garlic stems and green garlic uh, and those are fantastic and give a very good leek like sort of experience and then we plant another succession of um, uh, of green garlic and so we harvest that uh, so we do that in february and then we harvest in that sort of through until august and that's when the leeks early leeks come available so again it's kind of like a you know every variety that really needs leeks in it uh, sorry every recipe that needs leeks in it we've got some sort of leek uh, substitute all year round uh, and we've done that pretty much for every class of vegetable really uh, trying to find appropriate substitutes and then figuring out how to grow them so I've again I've really enjoyed uh, you know working on that in the book but also doing the growing experiments to figure out how to do it and I've really enjoyed all my seed starting at home it's made my life so much easier to be doing seed starting here and to be able to use my grow bench outside and the grow lights in the conservatory and I've actually got grow lights elsewhere in the house on top of a wardrobe um, it's just so convenient you know the watering so much easier I don't have to keep you know walking or cycling or driving to the allotment every day to look after them and all of that sort of thing and and because they're inside there's less pests uh, and they're in a more controlled environment I can control the temperature and the humidity and, the, and everything better uh, and yeah it's just been you know really has made life easy and just get consistent results by using grow lights I know now every week of the year pretty much that I can get you know radishes in 21 days ready for planting you know t um, lettuce in 21 days ready for planting spinach in 27 days ready for planting beetroot in 30 days ready for planting sort of thing and it doesn't matter what t what the time of year is I can always just get those same predictable results which means it's just really easy to plan so much easier than it was before when you really have you know sometimes in winter it might take you you know eight or nine weeks or something from sowing to be ready for planting and as a result of that I've discovered really that you can actually plant out a lot of stuff at lots of different times of year and get really great results and you're not kind of constrained to these ideal sowing dates that you might hear about uh, you can just do lots of things and just you know it just makes gardening so much more flexible and so much more productive and results in a diet that is so much richer I always have spare grow light capacity in sort of December time and never quite sure what I'm going to do with it um, and so this year what I've done is I've just grown things that are really difficult to grow uh, outside or in the polytunnel or the cold frames or whatever and those are things like radishes so I can grow radishes under grow lights here in about 22 days to maturity um, and so I can you know grow two or three batches of those and then just stick them outside in my little low tunnel and just keep them there and they just hold for you know six weeks or so so I can just do loads of batches of them as I say in December and then they're ready for January and, and sort of early February uh, and I can do the same with lettuce so I can grow you know rapidly bring to maturity nice lettuce hearts uh, and then just keep them uh, and you know and, and then they're just fine um, and I always find it quite difficult to have enough lettuce 
uh, over winter and this year it's been a doddle really just by using grow lights entire just just for that short period of time really just in December it's just made all the difference. The final thing that we did was we dug up the lawn in the front garden and planted a kind of ornamental kitchen garden there and that has just been so much fun I mean it, it looks so much nicer than the mossy lawn that used to be there uh, and it's just been a fantastic conversation starter you know when you're out in the front garden working and uh, people stopping all the time and asking you know what are you growing here and how are you growing it and doesn't it look pretty and everything and so it's just been a real revelation you know it's just been a fantastic social experience but it's just been a great new bit of growing environment and it's proved to be a really good growing environment for certain things because it gets quite a lot of shade so in summer it's really great for a lot of things that um, you know really benefit from that shade and so some things like spinaches and lettuces and salad onions and things like that have done really well there and kales as well and um, so it's been lovely and um, yeah it's been the kind of highlight of, of the year kind of bringing that on stream and that's mainly been Debbie's kind of creative endeavour and she's really loved it. I think I'll bring this to a close now I have alluded to quite a few things that were changing uh, this year uh, so I will do another video that brings all those things together because we are changing quite a lot of things uh, this year. Everything's kind of moving in the direction of making life easier whilst growing a lot of food. And um, yeah, more food, more varieties, more um, richness of diet and yeah, just a lot less effort. So I'm really excited for the changes and hope you are too. My name's Steve, this is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Allotment Channel, and I'll see you soon.